Hey there, TCC. Welcome to church. We're so glad you joined us here online today. My name is Ryan and this is Becca. Hey everyone. I'm so grateful for the opportunity to come together with you and worship today. If this is your first time tuning in to TCC, we want to extend a super warm welcome to you and tell you how thankful we are that you joined us. If you have any questions about the service today or Tulare Community Church as a whole, I invite you to connect with us through email or by calling the office. We would be delighted to make your acquaintance as well as to let you know about life and ministry here at TCC. Well, we are gearing up for our outdoor Good Friday and Easter Sunday services on our Shady Oak campus, also known as our front lawn. And we are so excited about the opportunity to come together outside for those services. Now you may be wondering why we're meeting outdoors for Easter weekend. Well, there are actually a couple of reasons. One, we are going to bring all of TCC together for a single service, both on Good Friday and Easter Sunday. We don't really have an indoor facility where we can fit everyone at the same time and still adequately social distance, so that's a big factor. Yeah, and plus, we know some of you who have been joining us online would feel safer attending an outdoor service than an indoor one, and we want you to have the opportunity to physically come together with the rest of your church that weekend. The other reason is we are inviting our surrounding neighborhoods and want you to invite your friends to join us that weekend. We found that being outdoors just makes for a really soft landing for those new folks. And the last reason is that we just like it. If you were here for our summer outdoor series, you probably get that. There's nothing like being outdoors among God's creation while we worship and celebrate all the things that he has done for us. So I hope you will take this challenge to heart and invite your friends, family, neighbors, coworkers, anyone, and join us for a powerful time of reflection, communion, and worship on Good Friday, and then celebration and praise of our resurrected Savior on Easter Sunday. But don't worry if you are unable to attend these services on the Shady Oak campus, because we will also come together right here online for Good Friday and Easter Sunday. We want to worship with you. Yeah, whether it's in person or online, we value your presence in our TCC community. And we are just so thankful that you are a part of our church. Well, we came here today to give our praise and worship to the one who is worthy of it all. We've got a great service coming up. I can't wait to hear the message from Pastor Shane. And right now, the band is gonna teach us a new song that I'm really excited about. So let's turn our hearts and minds to the reason why we are here today to praise our Redeemer, the one who came to deliver us. I invite you to join us now as we pour out our thankfulness to him. Take it away, worship team.
these words from Luke 18. As Jesus approached Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard the crowd going by, he asked what was happening. They told him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. He called out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Those who led the way rebuked him and told him to be quiet, but he shouted all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and ordered the man to be brought to him. When he came near, Jesus asked him, what do you want me to do for you? Lord, I want to see, he replied. And Jesus said to him, receive your sight. Your faith has healed you. Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus, praising God. When all the people saw it, they also praised God.
Hey TCC, go ahead and open up your Bibles if you have them to Luke chapter 18, Luke chapter 18. I don't know about you, uh, but this month has just flown by for me. You know, I can't believe that next week is Palm Sunday already. Now, maybe if you've been doing some hardcore fasting during this time, you're not feeling that well. You're going, what are you talking about? This is lasting forever. And maybe that's a good reason to fast during Lent, to elongate the season for reflection. Well, I didn't choose to fast this time. I, I was already coming off a, a personal time of fasting, and so didn't feel called to dive back into that. Uh, but if you have been fasting, I, I'd be curious to compare notes and just see what has our experience of just time been. But Holy Week is drawing near. We are heading toward Jerusalem to a triumphal entry, which leads to a cross, which leads to an empty tomb. And so whether we're fasting or not, we want to enter into this Lenten season with intention and deliberation, focusing our minds, inclining our hearts, pondering anew the words and stories and message and ministry of the God-man so that we better understand and see our desperate need for Jesus and so celebrate more fervently and rejoice more deeply his victory on Easter. But we're not there quite yet. We're not to Jerusalem yet. We are approaching Jericho where we meet a man with a desperate need for Jesus. Luke chapter 18, beginning in verse 35. As Jesus approached Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard the crowd going by, he asked what was happening. They told him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. He called out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. So those who led the way rebuked him and told him to be quiet. But he shouted all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and ordered the man to be brought to him. When he came near, Jesus asked him, what do you want me to do for you? Lord, I want to see, he replied. Jesus said to him, receive your sight. Your faith has healed you. Immediately, he received his sight and followed Jesus, praising God. When all the people saw it, they also praised God. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. Do you like your body? And I was reading a Psychology Today article, and they conducted a study and found that 56% of women say they are dissatisfied with their overall appearance. And 43% of men say that they are dissatisfied with their overall appearance, which is increasing. And that does seem like a bit of a problem. And it's led to a wave of body positivity, a body positivity movement. No body shaming. You know, Dove has a famous ad campaign with more natural, ordinary body types, and people really responded to that. Churches get in on the action. We love to say you are fearfully and wonderfully made. You are beautiful. Each one of us is beautiful. And that sounds nice. Of course, none of us actually believe that, but it sounds nice. Oh, for sure, we are fearfully and wonderfully made. But if what we mean by beautiful is that we are all physically attractive, well, that's just not the case. And friends, the, the Bible doesn't speak that way. It says that Rachel was beautiful. Leah, well, let's just say she had weak eyes. And we have no physical description of Jesus, but here's what we do have. Isaiah 53, verse 2. This is about Jesus. He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. If you were on a blind date and you asked what he looked like or what she looked like and you got back the answer, well, I'll tell you this. There's nothing in their appearance that would make you desire them. That wouldn't sound very promising, would it? You know, the Bible makes no such claim that we are all physically beautiful. It's not body positive in that way. You know, the real sad thing about the body positive movement is, as well-intentioned as it may be, I think it actually has the opposite effect because it puts beauty as the most important thing. We all need to be physically beautiful because Beauty is the most important thing. See, if all of our advertisements and schools and churches and everyone around us was constantly saying, you're a great drummer, and you're a great drummer, and, and you're a great drummer, we're all amazing drummers, and we all have our own drums, and we play those drums so well, such great drummers, your takeaway would not be that you're a great drummer. 
I think we all have a good sense of our drumming skills. No, your takeaway would not be that you're a great drummer. Your takeaway would be playing the drums must be really important because that's all I keep hearing about. See, body positivity has the exact opposite effect that it might intend because it obsesses and reduces us down to our physicality and undermines or ignores our other qualities. Are you smart? Are you funny? Are you talented? Are you interested? And we are obsessed with our physicality, particularly appearance, but in other ways too. So much of our time and energy and thoughts and intention are all about the physical. But Jesus tells us that we're more than that. We're body, but we're also soul. We're brain, but we're also mind. And there are things that are more important than the physical. Jesus says in Matthew, If your hand or your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life maimed or crippled than to have two hands or two feet and be thrown into eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into the fire of hell. There are things that are more important than the physical, and Jesus does come to save our souls, but he also comes to redeem our bodies, to redeem the physical, to redeem creation itself. It says in Romans, For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and the glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. When mankind fell, when mankind sinned by disobeying God, all of creation was infected by that sin, and it groans to be restored, and we groan to be restored. And we call to mind during Lent, remind ourselves that the answer to that groaning is Jesus of Nazareth. He redeems our souls and our bodies and creation itself while he's at it. And we desperately need that. You know, I'm starting to get up there in age and I'm really starting to feel it. I went skiing recently and my kids are just starting to learn. So occasionally I was teaching them and and guided them between my legs. And and so I'm in this kind of wide stance and going back and forth. And and after a little bit, my knees are just screaming at me. It hurts so bad. And I'm just like, okay, I, I am officially old. That is just what happened. You know, as we grow old, as our bodies fall apart, as they inevitably do, Uh, Those aches and pains that we endure and, yes, even suffer, those are poignant reminders to us that we need Jesus. 548,000. That's the estimated number of people who have passed away from COVID-19 in the U.S. 548,000. What's our answer to that? A vaccine? Yeah, maybe. Maybe. Maybe that'll sort this one out, but there will always be a next one. There's always been viruses, always been disease, always been plagues, always been pandemics. That is the natural state of a fallen and broken creation. And the only fix for that, the only answer to that is Jesus of Nazareth. We desperately need him. And just like this blind man calling out to Jesus, you see his desperation, right? People are telling him, shut up, but he's too desperate to listen to them. So he shouts all the more, son of David, son of David, have mercy on me. He's blind. It's a physical problem. But through faith in Jesus, he has healing because Jesus can make the lame walk. Jesus makes the deaf hear. Jesus makes the mute speech. Jesus makes the blind see. He is able to heal, to mend our brokenness, and restore us. And he promises to ultimately and internally redeem it all with a new creation, a new earth, and new bodies. Listen to these words from 2 Corinthians. For we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. 
Meanwhile, we groan, longing to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling, because when we are clothed, we will not be found naked. For while we are in this tent, we groan and are burdened, because we do not wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. Now the one who has fashioned us for this very purpose is God, who has given us the Spirit as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. It's interesting, isn't it, that Paul describes us as naked without our bodies. When we die and are without our bodies, we're unclothed and we need to be clothed with our new bodies. Human beings are meant to be soul and body, to be material and immaterial. We are meant to be physical. That is a defining quality of man. And so for God to become man, to be our mediator, to be our representative, and to die in our place, he must take on flesh. He must take on physicality. He takes on the fullness of humanity. Jesus is the incarnate deity. He is fully God, but he is also fully man. You know the term that Jesus used most often in reference to himself was son of man? Son of man, how how remarkable is that? He is a son of man and he enters into a line of men. This blind man calls out to him, son of David, son of David, because he is a son of David. Not just in terms of title, which he does have through his father Joseph, who can trace his lineage to David, but also biologically through his mother Mary, who can trace her lineage to David. Every single cell of Jesus of Nazareth contains a genetic line to David. It's not theoretical. It's actual. He takes on humanity. Uh, Listen to this from Philippians. In your relationship with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing. By taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. He humbled himself. He emptied himself. He takes on humanity. He takes on physicality and enters in and subjects himself to a fallen and broken world. This totally sufficient being subjects himself to hunger, and thirst, and exhaustion. This omnipotent being humbles himself and learns how to walk and experiences all the aches and pains and viruses that our bodies do. And he subjects himself to physical pain and suffering of a kind which few of us will thankfully ever know and becomes obedient even to death and tastes that bitterness with us even though he never deserved it. And this being with majesty and glory empties himself and comes to us with no beauty or majesty to attract us to him and nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. That's a hard thing. That's a painful thing. Let's not pretend it's not. And Jesus responds to this fallen and broken world perfectly, righteously, in a way that we never can because he is God and he has no sin nature. But that doesn't mean it's not painful. You know, I started with body positivity, not because it's more important. I don't think it is. But because when it comes to the function of the body, we better understand our need for Jesus. When it comes to cancer, we understand our need for Jesus. When it comes to this blind man, we understand his need for Jesus. We understand it when it comes to functionality, but we don't tend to understand or acknowledge it when it comes to form. What do we say about beauty? Beauty is fleeting. And that's true. When we age, our bodies break down and lose not just function, but also form. And the grief from that is it's not just vanity, though sometimes it is, but it's also an externality of sin, the consequences of a fallen world, and that is worthy of grief. We're right to be concerned with all the dissatisfaction and discontentment and anxiety and obsession that people have about their bodies, but that too is a consequence of the fall. It says in Genesis, Adam and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. But then when they disobey God and eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, it says this, When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. 
Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Now you can understand the meaning of this in more symbolic and maybe even deeper ways. But what I want us to see here is that sin causes a rift, not just between man and God, not just between man and fellow man, not just between man and creation, but between man and his own body. There's suddenly disunity and conflict between their minds and their bodies. And we need Jesus for all of it. To heal the rift between God and man, to heal the rift between man and fellow man, to heal the rift between man and creation, and to heal the rift between man and his own body. The answer to the conflict and disunity between our bodies and our minds is not denial. It's not exercise. It's not dieting. It's not plastic surgery. Those are fleeting solutions at best. No, the answer is Jesus. Because it's only through him that our souls and our bodies will be at peace again. But, it, but it's even more than that. Look at Leviticus. The Lord said to Moses, Say to Aaron, for the generations to come, none of your descendants who has a defect may come near to offer the food of his God. No man who has any defect may come near. No man who is blind or lame, disfigured or deformed. No man with a crippled foot or hand or who is a hunchback or a dwarf or who has an eye defect or who has festering or running sores or damaged testicles. No descendant of Aaron the priest who has any defect is to come near to present the food offerings to the Lord. He has a defect. He must not come near to offer the food of his God. That's the law. Only priests could minister before God. But even if you're from the line of priests, if you're blind, if you're crippled, if you're deformed, then you are disqualified from service. You are not fit to serve in that way. Now elsewhere in the law, there is compassion for those who have physical maladies. There are strong warnings about mistreating such people. But you can understand why the crowd responds the way it does to this blind man and why he's so easily marginalized. He's unfit. He's unworthy. Now, we don't know if he's from the Levitical line. The only thing that we do know for certain is his name. Luke doesn't mention it, but Mark does. In Mark's gospel, he tells us that his name is Bartimaeus. That's essentially his last name. He's the son of a guy named Timaeus. Bar Timaeus, that's what that means. Aside from that, though, we can't speak with any certainty. But Luke doesn't mention his name because for Luke, that's not the point he's making. The blind man could be anyone. He could be us. And in fact, he is us. You know, we have a tendency to put ourselves in the wrong category. Jesus chastises a church for this in Revelation. He says, You say I am rich, I have acquired wealth, and do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. During Lent, we aim to humble ourselves and remind our souls and our bodies that that is how we all came to Jesus. Wretched pitiful, poor, blind, and naked, crying out to the Son of David, have mercy, have mercy. That is what we were, dust, unworthy, unfit to go before his presence in his temple, unworthy, unfit to minister before him, unworthy, unfit to serve him. But then hear these words from Peter, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. We were blind in darkness, but he calls us out into light and makes us a royal priesthood. Jesus does it all. And through our faith in him, he doesn't just heal the function. He doesn't just heal the form. He heals the purpose of our bodies as well. What does our passage say? Jesus said to him, receive your sight. Your faith has healed you. Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus, praising God. When all the people saw it, they all praised God. In Romans, it says this. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, son of David, son of David, have mercy. In view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, this is your true and proper worship. Now, this means far more than raising your hands in worship or kneeling in prayer. But it doesn't mean less than that either. 
You know, this is an area uh, that I've been more convicted in lately. I think I'm a lot like you, a little bit more self-conscious when it comes to expressions of worship. And I'm deeply skeptical of the charismatic movement, and I really don't want to be told how I'm supposed to worship. And I have no interest in looking around and judging one another's worship. Plenty of things can be stirring in the heart and soul that are not external. But the notion, the notion that there is no connection between the posture of our bodies and our souls is nonsense. Uh, look at this worship in Revelation. All the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. They fell down on their faces before the throne and worshiped God saying, Amen, praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen fell down on their faces. Oh, they're worshiping in spirit and in truth, no doubt, but they're also worshiping with their bodies. When it says every knee shall bow and every tongue confess, I don't think it means metaphorically. Well, I'm, I'm kneeling in my heart. I'm worshiping in my spirit. Oh, Jesus has ransomed not just your soul, but your body as well. He owns it all. And man is not just spirit, but also body, flesh and blood. If that were not so, then the incarnation is meaningless. There is no reason to take on flesh. There is no need for a physical Jesus or his bodily resurrection. But Jesus comes to redeem man, who is body and soul, and so must become man, body and soul. We need that. We need Jesus for that. We need Jesus, and we profess that with our souls. We profess that with our words, and we profess that with our bodies. Let's do that now.
We need Jesus' body and soul. Hear these words again from Romans as a benediction. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Go in peace.